Welcome to Talking with Tatchell. The war on drugs has been a spectacular failure. It hasn't stopped drug use, nor has it stopped drug abuse. There is an important distinction, and it seems the government recognised this distinction when it moved in 2004 to declassify cannabis from a Class B drug to a Class C drug. But now, under pressure of sensationalist reports about the alleged harm of cannabis, the government is rethinking its declassification. Is the government right to be concerned? Should the public be worried? Do we need a tougher line against cannabis? Or should we go Dutch? Should we have a system of government licensed production and sale to ensure quality control and to break the link between drug dealing and organized crime? With me to discuss the future policy with regard to cannabis, what it could be or what it should be, are uh, Sebastian Saville, Executive Director of the Drug Agency Release, which campaigns for sensible, informed and rational drug policies, and Dr Evan Harris, MP, the Liberal Democrat health spokesperson who was, in his earlier life, a hospital doctor and medical researcher. Welcome to you both. You. I wonder if, Sebastian, you could just start by giving us your view about whether the heightened public concerns and media reports about the alleged dangers of cannabis, are they well-founded or is it all speculative? <clears throat> I don't think it's all speculative. There's been an enormous amount of hype without any doubt at all. It's clear to see that for a very small minority of people, probably those who have a propensity to mental health problems, smoking cannabis is probably not that uh, not a good thing to do. But for the vast majority of people who smoke cannabis, it seems to have no effect on their mental health whatsoever. Evan, you were on the uh, Science and Technology Committee. Uh, yeah. What was the view that that committee took? Well, I'm the Liberal Democrat science spokesman, not health spokesman, but uh, I think the two are inter intimately related. I mean, I think there's going to be a broad agreement because I actually share your view, or on this at least. Um, and. And the view of the Science and Technology Committee in our report that looked at drug classification, okay, and whether that was a rationally based scale, was that there was very little evidence, firstly, of the gateway theory, that, that doing cannabis led to doing harder drugs, so-called harder drugs, uh, or that there was any evidence that the classification of a drug had any significant effect in the way one would want it on the use Okay, so, so very little evidence for that, but that's what politicians, or at least the current government, the previous government, have always relied on. That's how they defend a drug classification system and an enforcement policy, which in my view doesn't work and has been demonstrated not to work. Uh, so although the, the, it wasn't the committee's remit to give a view on where the classification should be, I favour decriminalisation as a minimum and legalisation and taxing of it as, as, a, as the preferred option. Can any of you give, give any sort of scientific papers or medical evidence which, you know, supports this idea that cannabis use does not automatically or in most cases lead to, you know, heroin use or cocaine use and so on? Well, I mean, I, yeah, the I mean, expert here may well say, all I can say is our committee, our report, and this is our report mm. here, uh, which is available in all good parliamentary bookshops, was very clear that we said that we could find no evidence, and I'll just read you our conclusion and then... Uh, Sebastian will give you the detail. We said that um, uh, that in terms of sending out signals, um, we say uh, uh, we can find uh, the government's desire to use the class of a particular drug to send out a signal to potential users or dealers do not, does not sit comfortably with the claim that the primary objective of the classification system is to categorise drugs according to the comparative harm associated with their misuse. And we go on to say uh, in the uh, other part on this issue, uh, which is that um, uh, the relationship between, here we are, we make a claim that we don't find much of a relationship between classification and penalties would be helpful. So there's a number of clear conclusions. So, I mean, to answer your question about the, the, gate, the gateway theory, there's no evidence to support the gateway theory whatsoever. I mean, there are millions of people who smoke cannabis and a very small number of people who use class A drugs proportionally to the number who use cannabis. 
of course, if you look retrospectively back at people who do use class A drugs, it is likely that they may well have tried cannabis, as it is likely that they would have tried cigarettes and alcohol before they used class A drugs. But the vast majority of people who use cannabis never use a class A drug. And what about the idea that today's cannabis is much more potent and much more dangerous and likely to produce greater mental health problems? There has always been very strong cannabis. I mean, the 60s and 70s and 80s, there was a much greater variety of cannabis. Any self-respecting cannabis salesperson would have a number of uh, wares to sell, whether they be strong hashish from Afghanistan and Nepal or strong cannabis from sort of, Thailand and Hawaii, and more regular strengths, uh, hash from places like, not like Morocco. What prohibition has done, and it has done this in, in many markets, right going back to the alcohol prohibition time, it forces a strong, rather unsavory product to, be, to get onto the market. And this is what's happened now. Prohibition has really directly led to a situation where in the 80s and 90s, uh, people who want, wanted to make money primarily sort of in the criminal fraternity saw selling drugs as, as, a, as, as, a, as a new way and saw cannabis as something which was smoked by a lot of people and really the market got taken over by them, whereas before that it was run by more so aficionados of, of the cannabis market. So there was no point in bringing sort of a great variety. Let's just get a huge volume of hash from some Morocco and when that became sort of less attractive to the consumer, suddenly you've got a huge growth in hydroponic cannabis, which is what we see now. So although cannabis is not any stronger now than it was then, there may well be greater access to stronger cannabis now. I mean, partly, I think, as I understand it, the more homegrown cannabis is, the more likely it is to have uh, stronger characteristics. Um, so... Uh, but we were very clear. Well, firstly, when the decision was made to declassify or reduce the classification from Class B to Class C, the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs back in 2002 either didn't receive evidence on the increasing strength of cannabis as a factor or, 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 or didn't consider it. So it's fair to say that that point has not been considered in the current classification. I'm dubious, however, for the reasons we've just heard, as to whether it's a relevant factor, because uh, the reasons that I support decriminalisation and having it in the lower category as possible is nothing to do with the strength and the health effects. I'm perfectly prepared to accept, indeed, I, I take the view that it's not good for you to smoke cannabis. I've never smoked it. I'm one of the few MPs <laughs> uh, that I guess is embarrassed, uh, has the embarrassment of confessing that. And because I didn't smoke tobacco, I think it's bad for you. Uh, and um, and therefore I would argue that we need to educate people into not doing it for the, exactly the same reasons we try and educate people into giving up smoking cigarettes. But I think criminalisation doesn't help achieve that. It makes criminals rich, wastes the police time and fails in its main aim of preventing people from, from carrying it out, as we know from the history of prohibition. And I, you know, that's a pretty mainstream view, the view I've given. The Runciman Report of the Police Foundation takes that view. And I think many members of the ACMD, at least those with a scientific background... Are not What's the people. ACMD? That's the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs, which is the statutory body, body that advises the government within the current classification system. They can't go outside. Mm. I guess if they had the freedom to say, should we decriminalise, I think they would, or at least their scientific members would. Well, some of the ACMD might. Would you, would you apply that same view to alcohol, that it's bad for you and really you shouldn't do it? Well... I don't think, for example, with tobacco and cannabis, there's mm -hmm. a safe dose, OK? Mm -hmm. the, the, the risk, certainly from tobacco, you know, mm -hmm. one cigarette, it's not a safe dose. Whereas with alcohol, it is different. Not different in the nature of the harms it causes, because mm -hmm. the overall harm it causes is significant. Indeed, when Much the, greater. You, know, you, yeah, you well, would say that legal drugs like tobacco, mm -hmm. alcohol, prescription medicines... Well, for far greater harm and far greater deaths I've than I've heard cannabis. your theories on prescription medicines. I would separate that out because mm -hmm. prescription medicines, only when used in abuse, okay, in overdose or uh, uh, as a side effect of a, something that generally has a good benefit-risk ratio, is a problem. But if you take alcohol, there is a safe dose. In fact, it might be argued that a small amount uh, doesn't, certainly doesn't do you any harm and may have health 
benefits, but tobacco, there is no uh, safe dose, yes, it, yet it's legal. Cannabis, I think the same applies, probably has the same health risks. But so if someone who smokes sort of two or three joints in their teens, that's, mm. that's a dangerous thing to do? Well, it's not good for you, okay? It's not good for okay. you, um, but I don't think it's so harmful compared to other things mm. that it's worth criminalising you, because that's far more harmful for your welfare, having the of idea course. of criminalisation, forcing you into, the, into contact with people who peddle other stuff, okay, um, is not a good thing. Uh, so the, 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 the criminalising 60% of people under the age of 30 doesn't seem to me to be a sensible thing to do. Well, but that's why I'm crazy, in favour of legalisation. Well, yes, I, I don't <laughs> I mean, like to, I'm a politician, I don't like to overstate. Yeah. <laughs> what, 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 the total num <laughs> what are the total number of, estimated number of cannabis users in the UK today? The total number, is, is, it's hard to put a figure on, but... I think it's commonly accepted that about half of all young people will try cannabis and that you hear figures bandied about in the region of between th three and seven million people who use cannabis on a reasonably regular basis. Now, what regular means, do we mean every day, every week, every month? That's, that's it's, it's hard to quantify. So we're talking so, about a large it, proportion of the population it's, it's, who are criminalised. A, a, a huge thing, number yeah. of people who smoke cannabis. Of course, it's always very difficult to measure these things because it's illegal. So people who are, you know, people like uh, this gentleman here, if he was one of the MPs who statistically probably there are some who do smoke cannabis. You know, Almost certainly. Currently, not, yeah. not something they tried when they were 11 and they have deep remorse about now, that's, but currently do. That's rubbish, isn't it, of course? Like deep yeah, remorse. But, 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 but they couldn't say so because that would be the end of that. So there are other careers that applies to equally. So many people can't say this. I think the vast majority of MPs, given that they went to university, would have. I mean, I wasn't interested in smoking and wasn't often offered it. Yeah, The chess club at our university it wasn't a big thing. Mm. It says more about me than I think about the university, in fairness. So uh, not only do you criminalise young people, but uh, you, there's no evidence that reducing the classification from B to C increased the use. So these antis, these people who are... Firstly, we've got a moral panic about this. This is this whole hype, as, you, as Sebastian said, about the, the, um, the higher strength and the links with mental health. That's tabloid hype, and it's incredible the number of people who are simply going along with that. And, and whenever this is raised on Question Time, or particularly any questions on Radio 4, the people that phone in afterwards who are doctors point out that there's no good evidence, that there's a great deal of much stronger stuff, or that there's any new evidence about mental health harms. Okay, yep. so it's just this moral panic, and it really worries me that the government's policy is based on panic and not on evidence. Well, we've been measuring the proportion of the population, as, as you'll know as a doctor, who become schizophrenic in their life. And since the 19th century, it's consistently been about 1% of the population. Now, if cannabis was causing you know, a significant increase in the number of people who are becoming schizophrenic, we would have seen, since the 60s and 70s, a huge increase in that number. And it is still 1% of the population who are diagnosed with schizophrenia. Yeah. And so I think the main association yeah. is that it can make people with uh, a psychosis worse, exacerbate an existing condition. Mm. But the evidence that it's causal in people who would otherwise not go on to get it is, I don't think, very clear. Uh, and I think most people would say it's not clear. Mm. People with a tendency towards schizoid personality disorder may well be the same sort of people who seek solace or to use uh, cannabis. And that's therefore not causal. Uh, and mm -hmm. therefore that's the problem of analysing people with mental health and their previous cannabis use. May uh, indeed be using it to medicate themselves. Quite so. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's quite a lot of you know, anecdotal evidence that people who, ha who suffer from stress-related conditions find cannabis very therapeutic and, and very helpful. And possibly. I mean, you could argue that cannabis gives you a degree because the number of people with the cannabis use is higher among people who've been to university. Mm. But that's just because people at university are more likely to encounter it or do it, speaking generally, OK? I'm not trying to make a trivial point. I'm well, trying to show this danger yeah, of association. I think it's quite available across no, uh, indeed, but I'm across just saying on, social on structures where there's not many people go to university as well. I'm right, I think that uh, Dr Robin Murray at the Maudsley Hospital in South London, which treats psychiatric disorders, mm -hmm. He's on record as saying that the cannabinoids in uh, cannabis 
can actually be quite useful in uh, helping and, and, and treating um, mental illness. Treating or, certain aspects of, of, yeah. of, of mental health problems. Mm. Yeah. So I'd be dubious about citing individual doctors from psychiatry because there's probably just as many who are campaigning on the point of the dangers of cannabis because they see it exacerbating the symptoms. And as I say, I, I'm not defending this on the basis that cannabis is harmless or not dangerous and especially dangerous to individuals. I'm saying that from that point of view, the best way to reduce harm is not through criminalising it, and the evidence is that once decriminalising it, and then the same with Holland, does not lead to increased use. So I don't understand why people who are against it don't also support declassification, decriminalisation, legalisation. It's a win-win, and they could tax it, and then they could spend that money on education to reduce the use further, or enforcement of far more dangerous, far more addictive drugs. I mean, these to torturous debates which go on in, in the media and, and amongst politicians about you know, whether it's harmful to this tiny percentage of the population really is, isn't relevant to the law. I mean, yes, we recognise that many things can be harmful to a small proportion of the population, but that's no reason to, so to criminalise the huge amount of people who are smoking cannabis on a regular or, or an occasional basis who doesn't seem to be interfering with their lives whatsoever, and they're getting on with very productive lives in, in, a, in a number of professions. I, I always mm. use the analogy with cars. Just because mm. some people abuse cars and drive recklessly, that's no yeah, argument that's to ban motor cars. That's a very, very good analogy. And, and young people who drive fast motorbikes are probably at greater risk than those who are a little older, who maybe have a little more sort of common uh, sense. I, I, would, I, would, I, I would be careful about that analogy, because I'm, I'm a perfectionist on these things, because mm. cars if there is a safe dose of car driving, okay? And, and, if you, and if you banned cars, you probably wouldn't have a black market because it would be detectable. So, but I, I take the point that there are plenty of good things that are also dangerous to a number of people and predictably so. How is car driving a safe thing? I mean, if well, you, you can be the best driver well, in the world dri tell you, driving there down are the street significant, and, a tr and a truck can drive in the I, I don't There think are we need significant to go health <laughs> benefits from we... some car journeys, I, like I every ambulance journey. So... So banning it would... Well, there's, yes. you know, I don't yeah. think we need to go down there, but no, the, I the, think the, 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 right. the point is that, you know, extrapolating from the possible effects of cannabis on a tiny minority of the population and mm. generalising that to the whole population and generalising it as an effect of cannabis per se is not scientific, it's not rational, and it, it does not help the, the whole debate. I mean, I've often heard the figure of that, you know, something like 800 people a year get referred to um, mental health agencies where there may be a factor uh, of cannabis smoking or, or usage which, which, which could be related to their mental health problems. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, that, that, is, that, is, that is wrong and that, that, that is terrible for those mm -hmm. individuals. But out of, as you say, three to seven million regular cannabis users in this country, 800 is still very small and hardly... It's hardly appropriate to devise a social policy yeah. on the basis of a, a distinctly minority adverse effect. But, it, it, but it, it just shows how we assess risk, you know. People don't assess risk in a very scientific manner. There are things we do on a very regular basis which potentially are quite dangerous, you know, crossing the street. I mean, more people are killed every year on, on uh, pedestrian road accidents than certainly for, for taking illegal Trying drugs. Trying to arrest foreign dictators yeah, yeah. can be dangerous to health. But, uh, but, but it's not but, irrational, but, but, though, but is but it? It's, it's just it's, disproportionate. But it's the emotional, it's the emotional input and, 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 the sort of, and, and the sort of hype which is you know, generated by the press and, and, the, and, the, and the torturous things which politicians go through about drugs, which is unlike any other area, really. But, but having a concern about the health effects, even on a small number, I wouldn't say is not rational, as you put it, Peter. I would say that it's, in the end, not effective, because the remedy they're proposing, which is to increase criminalisation, doesn't have the desired effect, in fact, and it has perverse effects of the criminalisation of a large number of people. That, are, that make matters worse, and secondly, that it's not proportionate, which is the point that's mm. being made. Um, and, but what bugs me is the amount of hypocrisy. I mean, clearly, people are campaigning on this in, in Parliament for political reasons. Okay, Gordon Brown's trying to say that he's, you know, he's trying to appeal to a certain group of people by saying he's going to reopen this as Charles Clark, who I think never really believed. And it's strange that Charles Clark mm. should seek to 
up-classify, whereas it was David Blunkett who sought to down-classify that. But anyway, it's peculiar. And the Conservatives as well are keen to jump on a bandwagon. And they will use the high strength and the alleged and the mental health alleged as arguments. And what people like me who oppose them have to do is A, have the courage of our convictions, not be cowed by tabloid headlines, but secondly, point out that there isn't scientific evidence to back up either the extent of the dangers or that their policy solution would make a difference, and point out that other examples, other countries such as Holland, have found a perfectly satisfactory alternative which has allowed their police to address other problems rather than being forced to look at this. Uh, but it's very hard to have that sort of rational argument uh, today, and I find it incredibly frustrating. In terms of the way forward, I want to perhaps you perhaps explain, Sebastian, the kind of policy you'd like the government to adopt. I think it's very hard to see any sense at all in not having a regulated, controlled outlet for, for cannabis. And we could discuss other drugs as well, but this is yeah, about cannabis. And as has been said earlier, it seems that the Dutch have arrived at a very sensible situation where they have controlled outlets for places where people can buy and use cannabis. And it takes it out of the criminal market. It allows greater choice. It allows people to select whether they want the stronger version, the medium version, the not so strong version. And it just seems that this has got to be the way of the future. What's stopping it is really a lot of sort of politicians who really are very fearful of change. I think a lot of them off the record would like to be in that place but it's how we get from where we are now to this better place, which they're also frightened of. Because it's, this drug use has been erected as a great panacea of so much evil over the last how many years, that to now say, well, actually, we've had it all wrong this time, and all that time where we said we're going to get tougher and send people to prison for longer, is suddenly, well, we all made a big mistake and we should be doing this other place, is politically quite a hot potato to deal with. Well, I mean, it, you know, statistics are pretty clear. You know, criminalisation does, you know, create a link between organised crime exactly. and drug well, dealing. Clearly. Um, and I, I didn't isn't, repeat that because I assumed the views... That's, that's, isn't, that's there, the damage, isn't there yeah. evidence that something like more than half of all crimes in this country are drug-related, often by people you know, get, seeking money to feed a drug habit? Well, clearly, and that if, yeah. if, if legalisation took place and, and there was you know, con quality Filmed control... He says he doesn't uh, agree with the violent control, actions health warnings of Muslim and so on. Then he prefers you would the take people out of the underground criminal market, and the drug dealers and organised crime would be put out of business, and therefore people would 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 be able to address their medical and health needs in, in a more open way. But that's a broader question, isn't it? Because that mainly relates to heroin-type drugs, because very few people are stealing, which is the huge majority of the offences around heroin. To, to feed a cannabis habit. Sure. I mean, I'm not yeah. an expert, clearly. Yeah. I've confessed mm. my ignorance. But I don't think that most of my friends, most of my friends have smoked, do smoke cannabis. They don't steal to do it. Yeah, you're, you're right. You're so, right. so, but you're, you're, you, there's a broader point. But talking about cannabis, the key thing is to, to expect, poli to have a higher expectation of politics. I mean, the Liberal Democrats are very clear. We want to see legalisation once the treaty conditions are met, because there's treaty barriers to doing that. The United States has got a big influence on this but decriminalisation in the interim. And we think that the police who support that, and many do, should speak louder. And, and in fact, I would say there's a stronger argument for declassifying ecstasy from A to B than there is from cannabis from C to decriminalise, because it, well, to further decriminalisation of cannabis. And so I think the next battleground really ought to be the preposterous classification of ecstasy mm. in with crack cocaine, heroin and cocaine, which is crazy. And that's, we're even further away, depressingly, from politicians wrestling with that than, the, than we are about cannabis, because most, most of the shadow cabinet and the cabinet probably haven't done ecstasy, so they're not in the vulnerable Anne widdicombe type position of having to fess up if they want to change their policy. Now, now that you've brought up, brought up the treaties, I mean, to, to wait until the UN changes the treaties, we're going to be here forever. I mean, countries like Holland, who are also signed up to the mm. treaty, seem to have found, Portugal, a way, yeah. have found a way around. So are you saying the Liberal Democrats really are not going to change their policy until the United no, Nations I mean, treaty? our policy is legalisation mm. of cannabis, but we would have to 
we can't do that while breaking a treaty, so we'd have to derogate or something. So, so how, did, how, did more, the, how did the Dutch manage to... Well, I'm not an expert. And unfortunately, uh, my constituency yeah. is British and not Dutch, because so, I have enough so trouble really, from my... So, so, <laughs> from so, my so, so, so really, it's, it's a kind of safe way of it's saying... No, it's not safe at all. the, the United it's Nations treaties are not going to be well, broken. I mean, until countries individually stand up and say, we're not going to sign up to this ridiculous treaty. Well, I mean, we've, we've made our position clear. We support mm. the classification of B to decriminalisation, which we think we can do even within that. Okay, We can decriminalise it effectively okay. by not prosecuting at all and not putting it as Class C with penalties mm -hmm. attached. Legalisation is more difficult, Okay, but that's our policy, is to achieve legalisation. I don't think you... In fair, I don't think you could ask for more oh, no, so, from us. So I'm uh, and we've so paid a political price for that, actually. Uh, well, but that, so be it. Well, I, but I, th I think... I mean, at least Peter votes for us. But I, no, but I think politicians will soon find out that when they put their hands up and are honest about it and say, actually, this is what we want to do, they will get a surprise. A lot more people will vote for them. I think there's a, a great fear from politicians, which is largely unfounded. An increasing amount of the politician, an increasing amount of the... Uh, an increasing amount of the population mm. are beginning to say, hey, the emperor's got no clothes on with these drugs. And if a party would stand up and say, we're going to change things, I think they get a lot of support. Well, at, at certain points, because mm. if you remember a couple of years ago now, mm -hmm. obviously I'm not claiming you vote for us, Peter, of course, but, but if you remember a couple of years ago, or maybe three years mm -hmm. ago, the Daily Telegraph backed declassification, in fact, possibly decriminalisation yeah. of cannabis, uh, and the Independent on Sunday before its ludicrous change of heart presumably well, yeah. to capture a mood that it thought was yeah. changing, also supported. And there was widespread support. It's now, I have to say, it is a more difficult time because of the uh, hegemony of the, the moral panic people about the stronger uh, uh, brands, uh, mm -hmm. as it were, and the, and the alleged uh, increased mental health effects. So it isn't an easy time, but I know there are people in all the parties who are sticking to their view. Some who aren't, but there are people in all the parties who are sticking to their view. And my party is, although, again, it's not an easy time to do it. And I respect the fact there are people like you from, from knowledge who recognise mm -hmm. and are able to say uh, that there are positive benefits to be had in terms of public well-being and health from decriminalisation. Mm -hmm. OK, well, I want to thank you both for a very illuminating discussion. Um, obviously, this is going to be a debate that's going to go on and on, but it'd be very nice to hear your sane, rational voices in the House of Commons and the House of Lords. And let's hope the government isn't kowtowed and beaten by the uh, right-wing tabloids into changing its policy and instead moves the other way to uh, a drugs policy that is uh, rational, medically and scientifically based and which breaks the link with, with crime and encourages risk reduction and safer use rather than just the say no to drugs message, which quite clearly has not worked. Exactly. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, please join me again next week for another edition of Talking with Tatchell.